Okay, let's get rolling this morning. Uh, announcements? I have two. I keep, I will harangue you endlessly on this ASHRAE meeting <laughs> until it happens. So, uh, you know, please attend. Uh, if you, there, I sent a Zoom link so you could do it Zoom. Uh, I looked up the membership for you. I think it's 25 bucks to join and the Nashville branch will pay that for you. So I sent an application form. Uh, if you come to the meeting, you can just bring a paper copy or if you want to fill it out, uh, scan it or whatever and send it to me, I'll make sure it gets included uh, in the group that goes to Nashville that they, what they do, they just cut one big check for all of them and then send all that to uh, Atlanta, which is where the ASHRAE home office is. ASHRAE is a really good organization. Um, I, I know it, I mean, it is targeted towards the heating, ventilation, air conditioning industry, but lots of jobs out there and you don't really know you know at this point in your career you might say well i don't really know about that but then you know your senior year rolls around and you go hey man uh, they're hiring in nashville and they're you know nashville's booming as you all know and the hvac industry has just been going nuts all the firms there can't hardly do the work they got you know um, so it's something to think about and since it's free it sure doesn't hurt to have on your resume. Um, and we, you know, we don't do all that much. We typically will have some, we might go tour the chiller plant or the boiler plant here or have a speaker or two in. In the old days, we'd have pizza. I think we're gonna do Subway sandwiches on uh, uh, next, a, a week from today. They get individual wrapped sandwiches. So, you know, I'll, as you all know, the world's upside down. Um, and so that's uh, announcement one. Announcement two, I'm still recruiting for the Industrial Assessment Center, um, you know, and I love to hire juniors, you know, I occasionally hire seniors because, um, but we have a hard time getting them enough touches, enough trips to industry to really make it worth, you know, worth everybody's while. Um, you know, it's, a, it's 12 bucks an hour, it's a paid position. Um, we, we're going fall break to Wapaka Foundry in Tell City, Indiana. It's about a four hour drive. We're gonna go up there and spend two, we're gonna spend our whole fall break walking around this big old, you might say nasty in places, uh, uh, steel uh, foundry. They've got a cupola furnace and they remelt. They got equipment all over the place. They're pouring stuff and heating stuff and burning stuff and I mean, you know, to me, it's a cornucopia of mechanical engineering, and I just get all excited and tingly about thinking about going up there. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's not, I guess, for everybody. But, um, you know, we make probably 12, around 12, 13 uh, trips per year into different manufacturers. We've been to Brigstone, we've been to Nissan, um, we've been to lots of little places, you know, all over. So a lot of times we go spend the night uh, and you get reimbursed and all that stuff. You get a per diem. So if you don't, if you don't want to eat, if you don't want to eat a big steak, you know, if you, if you eat something more, re if you eat chicken, you can make money. If you eat steak, well, maybe not, you know, a little might come out of your pocket, you know, but, but you get a reasonable per diem. And, uh, and, you know, most of all, I think we learn something and we have a good time. We really do. So anyway, uh, Contact me uh, if you have an interest in that. Okay, enough on the announcements. Uh, the schedule you see, and I think I'm gonna keep putting that up there. I, I look at it just to make sure I'm staying on track with you know the amount of material and what I'm trying to cover and all. So we're in chapter five today and next week, uh, you know, we're off Tuesday for break. And then we're moving into six. We got three lectures in six, three classes and then test two. So, you know, boy, I keep going over those problems, keep going over those problems, looking at that stuff. You know, I think it's a good way to study, you know, because I mean, what are you gonna have to do? You're gonna have to work problems on a test. And hopefully you're not, I'm not gonna give you anything stupid. You know, I'm not trying to sink everybody, but I'm just trying to make sure that, that you're competent in the material. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're rolling on, so you'll get, uh, well, one, I'm not sure if you'll get two assignments out of five. You'll certainly get two to three assignments out of six. You know, six is uh, where we actually start applying the second law 
to all of our components and stuff. Yes, sir. How many homeless do you start to find? Uh, I don't know. Okay. It'll be, uh, you know, no more than two. Okay. You know, we'll, I'll just have to take a look at it. I've not really, uh, you know, jumped in and looked at all of the problems yet. So, uh, you know, just stay, stay tuned. One to two and probably three in chapter six. So you've got four to five more coming. You had what, three and four and so, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be a lot of problems to look over by the time it comes to study for the test. You don't wanna put all this off to the end because the material builds and it gets, it slowly gets more complex. Okay, <clears throat> so enough of the warnings and administrating, well, what did I do? Let's get on to this. So chapter five, the second law. Okay, so you're gonna, we're gonna find that the second law is just a different kind of beast. You know, what do we have? We have conservation of mass, conservation of energy, or the energy rate balance and the mass rate balance so far. Well, entropy is where, is the property that we're gonna wind up defining, but we don't do that till chapter six. So this is, this is kind of theoretical foundations and a little bit of practical stuff. There's not just tremendous problems that come out of chapter five. Uh, we, we saved those for six and seven, eight, nine. <laughs> Outcomes, y'all can read those. Okay, so uh, second law of thermo from conservation mass and energy principles, we, we have stated that in general, mass and energy cannot be created or destroyed. Um, you know, with I guess a little bit of a caveat for nuclear stuff, you know, if you set off a bomb, what's all that energy come from? Well, you're actually converting a little bit of mass into energy. Well, you don't see any nuclear bombs or reactions in this. Yeah, so, turn on the so as far as we're concerned, you know, uh, you, and that's, you know, you're not really destroying it. You're just changing form, you know? So anyway. Okay, for a process, conservation mass and energy principles indicate the deposition of mass and energy, but do not infer whether the process can actually occur, you know? So you can balance stuff all day long, but it's like in chemistry, you know, they probably, certain chemicals over there, they don't want you to mix together, right? Because you get this spontaneity <laughs> called an explosion. <laughs> And, you know, you can get hurt or whatever, you know, bad things can happen. Well, so, you know, I mean, if you're in the chemistry lab, the, the guy teaching the lab is going to say, oh, no, no, don't put those together. That's experience. But if you're looking at doing calculations or all to figure out whether something's going to explode, conservation of energy, conservation of mass won't tell you that, you know. And so... This is where we get into this property entropy uh, that will tell us a lot about what's going to happen. It tells us about equilibrium states, all kinds of stuff. Second law of thermodynamics provides a guiding principle for whether a process can occur. Okay. And it's, it's useful for a lot of things, as we will see. Uh, second law has many aspects which at first may appear uh, different in kind from those of conservation of mass and energy uh, principles. And those aspects are, we're gonna list some, predicting the direction of a process or processes, uh, establishing conditions for equilibrium, Determine the best theoretical performance of cycles, engines, and other devices. This is a big use. So, you know, given a, a particular scenario, if you want to generate some electricity, you want, you know, you want to have a refrigeration cycle, you know, theoretically, or for a carriers or trains or general electrics of the world that are out there making components, well, you know, this, this gives them a theoretical performance of a particular device or cycle that they can compare their device to because it may turn out that, you know, a, a given a high temperature and a low temperature and you're gonna generate some electricity uh, in between those, 
it may be that theoretically the best you could do is 45%. Theoretically. Well, if you don't know that, and you got some poor engineers like you guys out there building these things, and you get, man, we're 37%. And the boss goes, well, crap, why aren't you 100%? And the boss do not realize that there are theoretical limits on some of this stuff. And then you say, well, yeah, but boss, the, you know, theoretically, the best efficiency possible is 45%, and we're 38% up from 36%. Hey, give me my Christmas bonus, you know? I'm doing a good job for you. Yeah, so lots of, so, so people that actually manufacture equipment and systems and try to do performance improvements find this, these concepts very, very useful. Engines, uh, anything like that. Evaluating quantitatively the factors that preclude attainment of the best theoretical performance level. And so let's say you have a cycle and you have three or four different components that are working together. Could be a refrigeration cycle, a power generation cycle or something. Where should you go, you know, it, where, where's the most opportunity for improvement? Oh, well, how, I mean, and how do you know? Well, you can use second law type analysis and we'll show you where we call it irreversibility, friction, et cetera, dissipative effects, where you have most of those in the cycle. Should you look at the boiler? Should you look at the turbine? Should you look at the pump? Should you look at the condenser? You know, what's the, where, you know, where can you get the most bang for the buck in terms of making improvements? Okay, uh, other aspects, second law. Uh, we, the, it, you can define a temperature scale independent of the properties of any thermometric substance. But, you know, uh, most of our temperature scales and all this stuff are based on, like, the triple point of water, you know, the number of wavelengths of light, you know, I don't know, blah, 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 you know, look up all of the measurement standards. And, you know, they, they try to get away from physical things. I think a meter may be the last one. There's some, what is it, a platinum irradiate, something like, I, I can't say that right, a uh, bar that's over in some lab in France, I believe, that, that is the standard for a meter. <laughs> and they have to keep it at exactly the right temperature and humidity and all that stuff. And so that is the, I, I think that's still the primary standard, but anyway, in days gone by, there were, there were more and more physical type standards. And, you know, they try to move away from, you know, like a physical object that you have to go measure. Okay, I, I want to make my table exactly one meter. And so then, ah, well, we got to go to France and measure the meter to make sure we get it just right. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. They, I mean, and I don't stay up with all this stuff. You know, it would be interesting to Google and look at measurement standards and see where all those things are. Probably 20 years ago, I taught the measurements class and I used to have all that stuff, you know, on the tip of my tongue, but I've slept too many times since then. Okay, anyway, we can use some of this second law to help define a temperature scale. Uh, it's, it, it is used a lot in uh, developing the tables uh, for uh, the tabular values uh, such as uh, internal energy and enthalpy. Uh, and what it lends us to is this property entropy and it allows us to make other measurements and then calculate properties instead of trying to measure some of these things directly. Because so to measure an enthalpy directly is very difficult. Uh, scientists and engineers have found additional uses of the second law and deductions from it. It also has been used in philosophy, economics, and other disciplines far removed from engineering thermo. Okay. Um, it, one of the uh, aspects of the uh, second law is that systems tend to seek the lowest energy state 
systems tend to move towards random disorder. And when I was raising children in the house, and they were teenagers, I would walk into their bedrooms, and I would look around. And I'd go, entropy at work. Because you know what? When you're at most, not all, but most teenagers, when you walk in their room, you go, oh my God, I can't see the bed for all of the crap that's dirty stuff mostly. If it's a boy, for sure. If a girl, maybe not, maybe not so much dirty stuff, you know, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, well, there's always an exception. <laughs> there, there's a corollary to handle you, but we'll talk about that later. But anyway, um, you, you know, the, the, the fact that the universe keeps just expanding and, and you know, as it expands, we're supposedly we're, we're losing energy you know, it's just like going, you know, who knows where it just keeps going <laughs> and uh, becoming more random, more disordered. And so it takes energy, it takes expenditure of, of energy, time, and effort to bring order to not your bedroom, but everybody else's bed bedroom, you know? You, know so you, you get yelled at and they say, okay, go, I'm okay, I'll clean it up, you know? Go in there and, uh, you know, it, so that's an effort, right? It, it, an effort that you probably didn't want to expend. I'll tell you a little story about uh, when my son was, oh, I don't know, six, seven years old. He got, I don't know, $5 a week allowance or something like that. And uh, his mother told him to go upstairs and clean his room. And he go, oh, man. And he's, he's, she said, well, I'll tell you what. For $2, I'll clean it for you, thinking that he would be appalled with a $5 allowance. And he goes, two bucks? Man, that's a great deal, Mom. Okay, here, here's two dollars. He went upstairs, got two dollars, and gave them to her. And she went, well, crap, that one, did, that one didn't turn out right. <laughs> that wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get back. Okay. <clears throat> So at any rate, um, you can run into, uh, that would be interesting to, to Google uh, different applications in other disciplines for the second law and see what you find. Okay, the, now if um, this is the one slide that I added uh, oh, crud, out of the, uh, that's not in what I emailed out, I will, I may add some more uh, I didn't re-email for just this one slide, and this is this is uh, cut and pasted from your book, but I think it's pretty good, and they didn't put it in the slides, so I put it in the slides. Uh, so you got three different systems here that kind of illustrate uh, what we're talking about. Up there, A, up on top, we've got like a hot block of metal or something, a hot body. We took it and we heated it up in an oven, you know, two, three, you know, whatever temperature you like. Got some tongs, took it out here, and set it on the table. And just wait. Well, so by experience, you know what's going to happen. You put it in a 70-degree room, a 200-degree block, and wait long enough, what? The block's going to cool down. The air in the room probably would heat up a little bit, but if it's a lot of air in a big room, it probably wouldn't be enough to measure but that energy, you know, would not be lost. It would go from the block into the air in the room. And then, you know, in a, uh, if that's a control volume or whatever, you know, you could do calculations, this, that, and the other. Well, but, you know, as far as conservation of energy is concerned, it doesn't care. We could think about putting a 70 degree, that same block of metal on this table in a 70 degree room go out the door, come back three days later, and the block is now 200 degrees, and the room is, air is slightly cooler, that the energy went the other way. Now the only problem is, it's real hard to get that to happen. You know it's not gonna happen that way. But how, I mean, how, how can you prove it? How, how can you do a calculation and prove that? I don't know. Well, that's why we're studying entropy. The entropy would calculation would, would tell us what, whether the process was going to go, which way it was going to go. Um, I think 
I've already said all the blue stuff, so I won't uh, read that. Uh, another possibility is uh, we've got a, a Pepsi can. You know, every once in a while, do you ever get a Pepsi can and there's no Pepsi in it? It's sealed up and it, it, it is probably even has some pressure in it, but something screwed up on the line and you, <laughs> you, got, a, you, got, the, you got the CO2 gas and you got the can, but you didn't get the Pepsi, you know, or the Coke. Well, so if you had a valve on that thing or you pop the top, you know, what's going to happen? So we're saying over there on the left-hand side, we've got air or, you know, some gas in the can um, at an elevated pressure. We pop the top and, you know, what happens? All, the, all that pressure, the, that air in there that's under pressure, r rushes out of the hole or the pop top until what? We come to equilibrium. And so you've put some more molecules into the room, but the pressure equalizes out and, you know, it's a small can in a big room, you're probably not going to be able to measure the pressure change. You could for the can if you had a gauge, but not for the room. And once you get to that point, you reach an equilibrium and you're done. It's just going to sit there. But so think about reversing that. You set that, that can with an open valve on the top in the room and you come back two days later and the pressure is high in the can and a little bit lower in the room. Well, conservation of energy doesn't care, but it's not going to, it's not going to happen. It's not going to work that way. But you know that from experience. When you get into a complex system that you've never built before, or you start mixing chemicals that you've never mixed together before, yeah, you know, I wonder if this is a good idea, you know, is this thing, what's going to happen when we turn this thing on? Well, so the, the entropy calculation will give us insight into, you know, what direction things are really going to go. And the last one is just another example. We've got this mass suspended and we come in and we, you know, let it fall somehow, cut the cord, bam. Well, you're going to have a hard time getting it to, you know, if it starts over there on the right to come back later and have it suspended back up there, even though conservation of energy would say there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not going to happen spontaneously. So anyway, whew, that's probably enough of that. Okay, so there's no simple statement of the second law that captures all its aspects. Several alternative formulations uh, are found in the technical literature, and so we will cite three of those here. One is the Clausius. So this is like your, what we're back in, is, is it Latin class where you study, you know, the, the ancient Romans, Clausius and Brutus and all that stuff. <laughs> anyway, we get the Clausius statement. I'm not sure how this got named. And the Kelvin Planck statement, yeah, that probably makes you feel like you're moving back towards Brunner over there. All those fond memories of the physics department, you know. But no, we're not going to make you go back over there. And then the entropy statement. So we'll go through these. Uh, the focus, chapter five, is on the Clausius and Kelvin Planck statements. Uh, the entropy statement is developed and applied in chapter six, that is the foundation for the uh, definition of the property entropy. And entropy will be, it's, it's tabulated. You know, you look up the entropy of steam, saturated steam at 100 PSI, whatever. Uh, it's in the table. Um, like every physical law, the basis of the second law of thermodynamics is experimental evidence. I don't know if you've ever been harangued on this before, but all these natural laws like Newton, you know, sitting under the tree and the apple comes down and conks him on the head, you can't derive that. You can't prove it. You can only observe it. And you observe this over and over again and then smart people put some mathematics to it. And then we start writing equations and we go, oh, this is Newton's second law of motion. We'll prove it. We'll go sit under that tree and I'll shake it. <laughs> go sit under that apple tree and I'll shake it. You know, see what happens. That's how I'm going to prove it. You know, it happens every time. Now, it hurts more or less depending on the size of the apple, but that's part 
of the mathematical formulation of Newton's second law. So all this stuff comes from uh, observations of what happens in nature. Uh, while the three forms given are not directly uh, uh, demonstrable in the laboratory, deductions from them can be verified experimentally, and this infers the validity of second law statements. This, you know, if you, if you really delve into the foundations of thermo, it becomes a philosophy class. It's amazing. We, years ago, I taught and some other people around here have taught a graduate thermo. Uh, I think it was, it's, uh, what do we call it? Statistical thermo? No. Uh, I guess it was just theoretic. I had some 600, 6,000 level number. But you go through that book, that, I mean, this book, Guftopolis and Beretta. And I mean, all of this stuff, I mean, it's just all definitions. And if this, then this, it's like a logic. It's like a, a uh, philosophy course and a logic course, the foundations where all this rests on. I mean, it's, I mean, you hardly have any equations. You have a few, but you're all dealing in definitions. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know. I, it drives you nuts after a while, but you know, if you, if you accept it and go in and study it enough, I mean, it, 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 I mean, it, it makes sense, but it's a lot different than you would ever expect. Okay, so here is the Clausius statement of the second law, and you go, after we go through this, you go, oh, wow, well, I knew that. <laughs> it's impossible for any system to operate in such a way that the sole result would be an energy transfer uh, by heat from a colder body to a hotter body. Well, guess what, you can't get you can't get heat to flow from cold to hot. You can want to all day long, but I mean, if, if, if that's the, so, the sole resort. Now, we do, we have freezers and refrigerators and air conditioners and all that stuff, but that's not just the heat moving on its own. You know, say, I, say an air conditioner would move energy from this space out there. Well, how does it do that? Does it have a special whistle? Hey, guys, BTUs, get out there. No, that's not really what it does, right? It's got a working fluid called a refrigerant, and we put it in a cycle, and we make that refrigerant really cold, like, you know, 40 degrees. And then we blow air in the room, which is, in this room, is pretty cool but whatever, it's 75 degrees, 80 degrees, we blow it over a coil. Well, if it's 40 degrees in the coil and it's 75 degrees out here, guess what? That air is gonna get cold, right? And so then that cold air blows back in the room and it keeps the room cool. But where's the energy go? Well, then it's in the working fluid and then it goes through a compressor, which we have to put work in. And then we put it through a coil outside. Well, when it comes, that energy comes out of that air compressor, it's 150 degrees because the air compressor is boom, 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 with the piston cylinder. And when you compress a gas, it gets hot. And then you got another fan out there and another coil that's blowing 95 degree air across a coil that has what, 150 degree refrigerant in it. Guess what? The, the heat, the energy goes from the hot refrigerant to the outside air. And then that refrigerant comes back in and it just makes a cycle. Well, is that, is that a violation of the Clausius statement? No. We got a compressor, we got all these devices that are making this cycle go. That's not what this says. Say so it's impossible for any system to operate in such a way that the sole resort, that's the key, the sole resort would be an energy transfer by heat from a colder to a hotter body. In other words, all you can do is put like a conducting bar in between them. That's it. And so that's what, that's what this says is impossible. It's gonna go from hot to cold, no matter what you do, okay? So that's the Clausius statement. Uh, we have other things to define. You know, these early chapters are full of definitions. Uh, a thermal reservoir. 
thermal reservoir is a system that always remains at constant temperature, even though energy is added or removed by heat transfer. So the, the assumption is that however much heat we may be, say we have a high temperature reservoir. If we need heat at 1,000 degrees, we say, okay, I've got a high temperature reservoir at 1,000 degrees. And I can pull heat all day long out of that reservoir and it's big enough. It's like the whole ocean or something. You can pull a little bit of heat out of there and you're not gonna change. You're not gonna change the temperature. That's at least the, the, the concept here. Now I may not, you know, in reality, these things may not be 100% true, but this is the concept of a thermal reservoir. And we can, we can also dump heat into it all day long. If it's a cold, a low temperature, maybe we need to dump some heat out of something we can dump it into a thermal reservoir all day long and it doesn't heat up. It stays at that same temperature. Uh, such a system is approximated by the Earth's atmosphere, lakes, oceans, a large block of solid such as copper or anything else that you want to make up that sounds logical that would have so much thermal inertia and energy and mass and all that that you couldn't really effectively change the temperature of it by adding or taking a small amount of energy away from it. Okay, so on to the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law. It is impossible for any system to operate in a thermodynamic cycle which means we have several components and we have a working fluid and it goes through this cycle and it always comes back to the same starting point and deliver a net amount of energy by work to its surroundings. And so our definition, that would be what? Positive work done by the system and transferring work into the surroundings while receiving energy by heat transfer from a single thermal reservoir. Okay, now power plants have a high temperature reservoir. They generate some work, but they also have a low temperature reservoir. Now, if you don't need the low temperature reservoir, what would be the efficiency of this? If this thing is sitting there just working steady state, going through a cycle, whatever you put in is all getting converted to work. And so there's nothing left over to reject. So what's that make the efficiency? 100%. And that's what this is saying is impossible. You can't have any sort of a cyclic device where you transfer heat in, get work out, and have 100% conversion. You have to reject some heat to a lower temperature part of the surroundings. That's, I mean, now, nobody can prove that, but nobody's ever been able to do it either. <laughs> okay, now here's the entropy statement of the second law. Mass and energy are familiar examples of extensive properties used in thermodynamics, we know that. Entropy is another important extensive property. How entropy is evaluated and applied is detailed in chapter six. Unlike mass and energy, which are conserved, entropy is produced within systems whenever non-idealities, <laughs> Whenever non-ideal effects such as friction are present. Well, you, there is no existing system. We also call that dissipative effects. Also call it irreversibilities. We're going to define some extra terms. You can't build anything that doesn't have friction. I'm sorry. Now, you can conceive ideally in your mind of a system and ignore friction from your calculations and say, well, okay, if this thing was ideal and perfect, it wouldn't have any friction. So I'm gonna go through the calculation and I'm gonna ignore all friction. That's fine. And you can get a performance 
that is greater than the performance you're going to get when you build it because yours is going to have friction. Okay, but so you can then get an ideal performance that you can compare to. Uh, and so this property entropy, anytime we have any of these um, non-ideal processes or effects, entropy always increases. It, 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 it never goes away. It just gets bigger and bigger. And it's kind of like my midsection. <laughs> it never goes away. It just grows. <laughs> Uh, it is possible for my midsection to get smaller, but it's way too painful. About once every three years, I gird up and lose 10 or 12 pounds. And it's so painful. I can only stand to do it about every 10 or 12, or every two or three years. Oh, it's awful. Anyway, you know, I hope none of my bosses ever hear this lecture. <laughs> I might get fired. I don't know. Yeah, that would be all right, too. Uh, the entropy statement is, it is impossible for any system to operate in, in a way that entropy is destroyed. You can't destroy it. If everything is ideal, it can be constant. But any real process, you're going to have the entropy is going to increase by the fact that the process occurred. Okay, and we'll, you know, we'll have more on that, a lot more on that later. Irreversibilities. Uh, one of the important uses of the second law of thermo in engineering is to determine the best theoretical performance of systems. So we have made reference to that previously. By comparing Actual performance with best theoretical performance insights often can be had about the potential of improving performance. Um, when we get to chapter six, we will define the isentropic efficiency of a turbine. And say, I think we we mentioned if you if you do just an energy balance on a turbine. I mean, the, the energy that is dropped in the steam as it goes from the inlet to the exit of the turbine, of the turbine is almost all converted to work. The efficiency, efficiency will come out 99.7% every time, <laughs> no matter what turbine you put on. Well, oh, crap. I mean, what good is that? You know, so, well, I could run the efficiency, but it's going to be 99.7 or 99.8. It always is. That doesn't do me any good. So what we do is we define an ideal turbine, one that produces no increase in entropy across it, which is impossible, but we can define it thermodynamically and we can calculate its performance. And then we calculate the performance of the one that you built in the shop. And we divide those two and we get, oh, well, that's 62%. Oh, all of a sudden we have a real comparison. If I go by the big one that TVA has is probably 85% isentropic efficiency. So see, it's an efficiency, it's a real, it's the performance of a real device divided by the performance of an ideal device. And all of a sudden we get something that really is very productive and useful, okay? So, so you know, as we go forward into chapter six and beyond, when you see an efficiency, you know, you have to be careful. Is this a first law efficiency, which comes from an energy balance around a control volume, productive energy out like a boiler, productive energy out divided by costly energy in, or is it a second law efficiency, which is the comparison of a real pump to an ideal pump, a real compressor to an ideal compressor, a real turbine to an ideal turbine. And the ideal is always one that produces no entropy because the real one has to produce entropy. That's what the second law tells us. And the amount of the entropy increased is determined by the amount of the irreversibilities, the amount of friction, the amount of turbulence, the amount of you know, heat loss, et cetera, from the device. Okay. Best theoretical performance is evaluated in terms of idealized processes. 
actual processes are distinguishable from such idealized uh, processes by the presence of non ideal I can't say that, called irreversibilities. You know what I mean. Well, what are some commonly encountered irreversibilities in engineering practice? Ah, uh, this is great. <laughs> you guys are just gonna love chapter five. Heat transfer through a finite temperature difference. Hmm. So think about it. Now, based on what we said about what the, 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 the Clausius state was, is, is that the one about the heat? Yeah, that was the first one, not the, the heat won't go from what a cold temperature to a high temperature it goes from a high temperature to low temperature well if you want to make heat transfer more reversible or to get rid of the irreversibility the irreversibility is caused by the difference in temperatures right the further those temperatures are apart the more irreversible it is well by converse logic i could make it more less irreversible closer to reversible by bringing those temperatures together. Well, if I want reversible heat transfer, I have to have infinitesimal temperature difference. Oh crap, okay. So if I can only have an infinitesimal temperature difference and I wanna transfer a finite amount of heat, how much surface area do I have to have? A whole bunch. <laughs> so to get reversible heat transfer, the, the temperature difference has to go to zero and the contact area has to go to infinity. <laughs> it's a little expensive to build one of those things. <laughs> but that's how you accomplish reversible heat transfer. It's through an infinitely small temperature difference. But it, when it, the, for it to be reversible, it has to go to zero. But if it goes to zero, there's no heat transfer. You see how I get kind of caught in, I mean, you see how this becomes almost philosophical in nature, some of these discussions. But anyway, so if I've got a surface here that, you know, if I've got my block that's 200 degrees and it's losing heat to the room, that's 70 degrees, that's a pretty good delta T. That tells me that that process is irreversible. It's not going to go the other way by itself. Okay? Because I can't get energy to go from 70 degrees to 200 degrees spontaneously. The only way I can move the energy the other way is to have some equipment that you know, takes that air, compresses it to 300 degrees, blows it across the block, heats the block up, and then you vent the air. Well, okay, yes, I can do it, but I can't do it spontaneously. Um, unrestrained expansion of uh, a gas or liquid to a lower pressure. So, you, you, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I got a liquid flowing through a pipe. I put it through a partially open valve and it goes from 100 PSI to 50 PSI. Well, guess what? I can't get it to go the other direction. <laughs> if I got 100 here and 50 there, it ain't going to go the other way, you know. It just unrestrained expand, you know, in terms of a gas or a liquid to a lower pressure. So once you get it to lower pressure, you can't get it to go the other way. Spontaneous chemical reaction. You know, you got some gasoline and you throw a match in there. You gonna get that to go the other way? I don't think so. Or you are you mix your chemicals together. You throw some what lithium, is it lithium that explodes in water? I think it is take some lithium chips and throw it in a pail of water. Yeah, okay, okay. You, you, oh yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, you've been in that periodic table since I have. <laughs> good, good work guys, appreciate that. Okay, spontaneous mixing. Okay, it's like, you know, air is what? Nitrogen, oxygen, and a few trace gases. So if you take a container and you put different quantities of those in, it's not like the nitrogen stays over here and the oxygen stays down here and the trace gases are over here. They all mix up together. 
Well, you, you don't have a magic whistle you can blow <laughs> and all the oxygen runs over here and the nitrogen down here and the argon and trace gases over here. It don't work that way. I'm sorry. You know, once it's mixed, it's, it's going to be a lot of work to separate them back out again. You're going to have to get membranes or yeah, I guess you could cool it down cryogenically and they would, they, would, they would condense to liquids at different temperatures and you could drain them off the bottom maybe, you know. Yeah, but maybe you want it for later, you know, I don't know. Well, but then you could recover it from the oxidized product, right? You could break the CO2 down into, because you sure don't want CO2, right? That's what I call the dreaded gas, no. Anyway, we don't want to go there. We don't want to wax political here. All right, friction, you know. You, I mean, you know, the, the energy's gone. It turned into heat, got dissipated. So anyway, these are what we call common irreversibilities. And if any of this is, is present in a process, then it can't be considered reversible or ideal. Electric current flow through a resistance, you know? Like my space heater that's down in my office, it keeps me from freezing to death when it's 66 degrees, right? Yeah, you know, I run my those little electrons through that uh, heating resistance coil, and man, that thing glows red. And I huddle up to it and ah, uh, prop my feet on top of it. Uh, I feels great, you know. But you know, I can't, I can't, I can't make it go the other way. I can't put heat into that strip and get electricity out the other side. Irreversible. Magnetization. I don't know much about it. I'm, I don't have a good example of it. Inelastic deformation now, you know, you do your tensile test. Okay, if you, if you keep it elastic, right, you stretch it and you let it go and it springs back. Oh, so you get the energy back. But if you pull it too hard, what happens? You put a permanent set in it and then that energy is tied up in that permanent set and you can't get it back. I mean, I guess if you, if you heated it up again, maybe you could get it to relax. You know, I don't know, you'd have to ask John Zhu about that, but uh, that would be uh, an irreversibility. So all actual processes involve effects such as those listed, including naturally occurring processes and ones involving devices we construct from the simplest mechanisms to the largest industrial plants. So during a process, of a system, irreversibilities, it says may be present. If it's a real system or process, they will be present. Uh, but this is different location. So, you know, and see, we, we have these different ways that we idealize systems and make them, you know, I, uh, reversible and ideal so that we can then compare real systems to. So we can think about uh, those irreversibilities may be within the system, you know, and the system is wherever we draw that boundary. You know, we can put things in the system, we can take it out of the system. You know, that's, up, that's up to whoever's doing the analysis. Or within its surroundings, usually the immediate surroundings, but it doesn't have to be, or within both the system and the surroundings. But, you know, there is a distinction about irreversible effects, where do they occur? Are they in the system or the surroundings or both? Because we can have, we will have uh, examples of things that we say the system is internally reversible. Well, there may be, there, there may be like an irreversible heat transfer and we define the system to just be the gas itself or the, the fluid and then the heat transfer is coming in but the irreversibility then is considered out from the system, I mean, from the surroundings and not internal to the system. So some details that, that, that we'll work through. Uh, a process is irreversible when irreversibilities are present within the system and or its surroundings. So the overall, even if inside the system, we can assume uh, everything's reversible. If there's an irreversibility involving the surroundings that's tied to that process or system, then the whole thing is still considered irreversible. All actual processes are irreversible. Bingo. 
A process is reversible when no irreversibilities are present within the system and its surroundings. So I know this is, this gets, uh, oh, it's just, you know, definitional stuff, but you have to be clear on this stuff when, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna really understand what's, what's going on. This type of process is fully idealized. Um, the process is internally reversible when no irreversibilities are present within the system. Irreversibilities may be present within the surroundings, however. And an internally reversible process is a quasi-equilibrium process. Oh, the old quasi-equilibrium process raises its ugly head again. And remember, that's the one that goes very slowly. You know, let's say we're doing an expansion and we've got a piston cylinder here and we got, we got weight holding it down, but the weight is comprised of, you know, a thousand little pebbles. And so when we go from here, we let the thing come up, we take the pebbles off one at a time and wait. Take another one, wait. Take another one, wait. And that's so that process happens slowly without great amount of uh, chaos and turbulence and all that. So it happens smoothly. And so our equations of state, our ideal gas law, whatever, holds throughout the process. That's the concept there. So if it's internally reversible, it's also a quasi-equilibrium type process, or quasi-static is another word for it. Okay, internally reversible process. So here's an example. Ah, the old piston cylinder with some liquid water. We're gonna heat it and we're gonna vaporize it, okay? Water contained within a piston cylinder evaporates from saturated liquid to saturated vapor at 100 degrees C. So that would tell us what, we got one, one uh, atmosphere you know, atmospheric pressure in the container. Um, as the water evaporates, it passes through a sequence of equilibrium states while there is heat transfer to the water from hot gases at 500 degrees C. So we're gonna blow some 500 degrees C gases on the bottom of that thing, but we're gonna define our, um, our system to be just the water and so because it happens very slowly through a sequence of equilibrium states, we can consider that to be internally reversible. Uh, for the system enclosing uh, the water, there are no internal irreversibilities, but such spontaneous heat transfer is an irreversibility in its surroundings i.e. an external irreversibility. So the overall process is still irreversible even though it's internally reversible. <laughs> ah, it's great stuff, great stuff. Man, I hadn't done this stuff in a while. Like, like a walk down memory lane here. Okay, so analytical form of the Kelvin Planck statement, okay? And so you see, they're gonna illustrate this with uh, a mass. So uh, we have a high temperature reservoir and we're gonna transfer some heat into some sort of a device and that's it. We're not rejecting any heat. So that tells us that we cannot raise that weight without rejecting heat that would violate the Kelvin Planck statement. Now, if the weight is already raised, we can let it fall and the falling weight turns the shaft and puts energy by work into the system, which may cause it to heat up enough that it would, could then transfer heat into the thermal reservoir. That's fair game, okay? There's nothing in Kelvin Planck that says that you can't put energy by work into that system, generate a high temperature, and 
let that heat be transferred to a reservoir. It just says that you can't take heat out of one reservoir, produce work, and not reject heat to a second colder reservoir. So, so now slowly we can put some little bit of math on this. So we see that that, that mass going up or down, that's a work interaction. And so the work for this, and that's a cyclic device, the work of the cycle um, can be less than zero or there are uh, internally, internal irreversibilities present. Can be equal if uh, internal zero because positive means that 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 cycle is raising the weight. That would be you know when that rate when that weight is raised by that system, that's positive work in terms of that system, and we're saying that's not possible because of the Kelvin Planck statement. So uh, you get tied up in the word sometimes, but uh, that's how we start putting some mathematics to this in, so, uh, in symbolic form. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at applications to power cycles interacting with two thermal reservoirs. Okay, so now we got something that's uh, a possibility there. We've got a hot reservoir transferring heat into our system um, and some of that energy is converted into work, the work of the cycle, and the rest of it is then rejected to the cold reservoir and the amount of the work is what comes in minus what is rejected to the cold reservoir. So the math is extremely simple. Okay. So, well, we can write the thermal efficiency. Well, okay, so you know, the, the thermal efficiency, and this is a first law efficiency. This is the desired work output, W sub cycle, divided by the costly input, which would be the energy from the boiler or whatever. That would be QH. And if you, and you see that work cycle is QH minus QC. So if you uh, substitute that in for W cycle, then you've got, um, QH over QH minus QC over QH, or that's one minus QC over QH. So the math is pretty straightforward, okay? By applying Kelvin Planck statement uh, of the second law, three conclusions can be drawn. The value of the thermal efficiency must be less than 100%. Well, you know, let's say I'm putting in 100 units of energy and I'm rejecting 40 units of energy. So I'm getting 60 of work, the difference. So 60 divided by 100 is going to be less than one. I mean, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Two other conclusions. Are there, these are called the, the uh, Carnot corollaries. Um, the thermal efficiency of an irreversible power cycle is always less than the thermal efficiency of a reversible power cycle when each operates between the same two thermal reservoirs. So if they're operating between the same temperatures, one is ideal and the other has irreversibilities, friction, whatever, heat transfer, heat transfer, all kinds of stuff. So the ideal one is going to have a higher efficiency. I mean, there's, that's not much of a stretch. <clears throat> and is it, so the, this one's, uh, you have to think about a little bit. All reversible power cycles operating between the same two thermal reservoirs have the same thermal efficiency. So it doesn't matter if it's reversible. It doesn't matter what's in the box. All you got to do is say, it doesn't matter what's in the box, what's inside that system. 
can be anything, as long as it operates in a cycle. If it's reversible, then this equation will give you the thermal efficiency of all of them. It's the same, because they're all ideal. That's interesting. So those, those two are known as the, Corn, the Carnot corollaries. Uh, and just to remind you, cycle is considered reversible when there are no irreversibilities in the system as it undergoes the cycle and heat transfers between the system and the, the reservoirs occur reversibly, which you know, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's quite a trick to do reversible heat transfer. Okay, applications to refrigeration and heat pump cycles. So, you know, the diagram looks pretty similar, what? But instead, we're pulling energy out of the cold reservoir, putting it into the system. Then we have to put some work in to make this thing operate. We have to, you know, maybe uh, turn the compressor to make the refrigerant hot and cold, et cetera. And then uh, we're gonna reject QH, which is gonna be the sum of QC plus the work up to the hot reservoir. And so we have to expend work because we're trying to transfer heat from something cold to something hot, and that's not gonna happen easily spontaneously. So we need equipment, we need a cycle in order for that to work. Okay, so now let me ask you this. So if you have a, say you have an air conditioner, what is the, what is the cold reservoir for an air conditioner? It's your room what you're trying to keep cool. Could be your refrigerator or a freezer or whatever. If it's just an air conditioner, it would be the room. So what is the hot reservoir? Where you're trying to put that heat? Outside, probably. Usually, eventually it's gonna go outside. Okay, now think about a heat pump. So now think about a heat pump. What is the cold reservoir for a heat pump? Correct. And what is the hot reservoir for a heat pump? The room that you're trying to heat. So that's the only thing that changes in this discussion between a heat pump and an air conditioner. The definition of the cold reservoir for the uh, air conditioner is the room. The definition of the cold reservoir for the heat pump is the air outside because now we're trying to get the refrigerant so cold it might be zero out there but if that refrigerant's minus 20 ah zero looks great when you're minus 20 you know ah feels so warm and balmy you know so you circulate the minus 20 refrigerant through a coil where the you got zero degree air and guess what the air gets colder because the heat enters the refrigerant so you have sucked heat into the working fluid. Then you put it through the compressor, boom, 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 and it gets hot, which may be 120, 130, whatever. And you put it through a coil in your house and you blow your room air across it and that air gets warm and it goes into your room and you go, oh, it feels so good in here, okay? So, but it's the same equipment, same coils and what happens, there's a reversing valve in there, if you really look into the HVAC, and it just changes, it changes the flow path. When you come out, when you come out of the compressor, the reversing valve puts that flow through the inside coil if you're on a heat pump, and if you're on air conditioner, it takes that hot gas and it puts it through the outside coil because you want to dump that. So anyway, but I just want you to be clear. I mean, the equations look the same, but we change them a little bit depending on what's, what's the desired product. For the air conditioner, the desired product is QC, right? Because we want to suck the heat out of the room. For a heat pump, the desired product is QH because we want to heat the space. 
So we change the equations a little bit and you'll see that. Okay, so the coefficient of performance and what? That's an efficiency, but it's greater than one. And so we get real nervous. Engineers don't like calling efficiencies greater than one. So we just change the name of it. So we call it the coefficient of performance. On effects is the COP. Okay, so COP is coefficient of performance. It's the efficiency and it can be, we'll see, we'll have a very different equation for the heat pump. This is for the refrigeration cycle. So you see the desired output is Q, Q sub C. That's what keeps the space cold. And the costly input is the work that has to go into the cycle, okay? And so then just putting the, the symbols in for the, the, the work of the cycle, we get QC divided by QH minus QC. And they call this, uh, these authors always call that beta for the COP of the air conditioner, okay? And guess what, for the heat pump, it's similar, but look, QC changes to QH because the reason we run the device is to keep the space warm. So it's QH that we want. And so we get a different number, okay? And then, so it's QH divided by the, the work of, the, uh, of going around the cycle, which is would be QH minus QC, okay? Okay, so applying Kelvin Planck statement, the second law, equation five, five, three. Well, oh, wow, well, that's just the Kelvin Planck statement. I'm not going to find it. Okay, for a refrigeration effect to occur, network input W cycle is required. You can't get the energy to go from the low temperature to the high temperature without expending work in a cycle. Accordingly, the coefficient of performance must have a finite value. Yeah, I guess that's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't divide by nothing because you're gonna have to have some work. Oops, there we go. Uh, two other conclusions. Uh, coefficient of performance of an irreversible refrigeration cycle is always less than the coefficient of performance of a reversible for the same arguments as before when they operate between the same two reservoirs, the same two temperatures. And all reversible refrigeration cycles operating between the same two thermal reservoirs, i.e. temperatures, have the same coefficient of performance. So that follows directly analogous to what we said to the power cycles. And, the, and those same conclusions apply to the heat pump as well. So, uh, very good, very good. If I'm going too fast for, if I'm going too fast, you're taking notes, you can throw, <laughs> throw something at him <laughs> and I'll understand. <laughs> That wasn't very nice, was it? No. <laughs> but, you know, reality is I'm not very nice, you know. So Y'all just don't know me very well. All right. Uh, Kelvin temperature scale. <clears throat> Consider systems undergoing a power cycle and a refrigeration or heat pump cycle, each while exchanging energy by heat transfer with hot and cold reservoirs. So that's just our two pictures put together. Uh, the Kelvin temperature is defined in such a way that um, QC over QH reversible is equal to TC over TH. So this allows us to substitute temperatures for these Q terms in our uh, coefficient of performance and efficiency equations. So this actually is very practically very useful. And there's, 
Now, if you go back and read in the thermo literature, there's a lot of discussion about this. And um, I don't know, I may, depending on time, I may bring some more of that to you. At this, at this point in thermo one, you just kind of have to accept this um, as the case. I know, uh, I can't remember all the arguments I'd have to go review, but it goes on for a little while, uh, all the different implications of this. Uh, in other words, that equation states that when cycles are reversible, and only then, the ratio of the heat transfers equals the ratio of the temperatures on the Kelvin scale. Where TH is the temperature of the hot reservoir and TC is the temperature of the cold rip. Uh, that's, whoa, that should say, oh my. Well, we have a mistake here. TC is the temperature of, my goodness, I didn't catch that. I'm gonna fix that. Yeah, there we go. I guess I'll, I'll be sending this out again. Or the cold reservoir, okay? Uh, as temperatures on the Rankine scale differ from the Kelvin temperatures only by a factor of 1.8, then that's true. You know, we, we can use these equations for either uh, Fahrenheit or for, uh, uh, Kelvin or Rankine. Doesn't matter. Um, but the equation five is not valid for degrees C or degrees F. So, so that should not surprise you. Again, another opportunity to screw up if you don't use absolute temperatures in the calculation. Oh, how are we doing here? 40, yeah, we'll do another. I was hoping to get through all these, but we're not gonna make it today. Uh, maximum performance measures for cycles operating between two thermal reservoirs. Uh, previous deductions from Kelvin Planck's statement of the second law include thermal efficiency of an irreversible power cycle is always less than thermal efficiency of a re reversible power cycle. Well, we've been through that. And coefficient, uh, we've said that. Um, uh, it follows that the maximum theoretical thermal efficiency and coefficients of performance of these cases are achieved only in reversible cycles. Yeah, we know that. Okay, so now we're gonna substitute in the temperatures from the heat transfer terms because of that definition of the uh, uh, thermodynamic uh, temperature scale. So this then, this then is very useful. And this is what we actually, we typically, now there, you may have problems where you, have, you work with the Qs as well, but it's very common to work with these expressions for your efficiencies and coefficients of performance. So you want to note those temperatures for sure. And just realize if you need to, you can replace the Ts with Qs. Uh, and that has to be absolute temperature. Okay, so let's finish this and then uh, we'll cut it off today. Um, power cycle uh, analysis and example. A system undergoes a power cycle while receiving a thousand kilojoules uh, by heat transfer from a thermal reservoir at a temperature of 500 K and discharging 600 kilojoules by heat transfer to a thermal reservoir at, and so you got case A, 200K, case B, 300K, and case C, 400K. For each case, determine whether the cycle operates irreversibly, reversibly, or is impossible, okay? And these problems are really very, very simple, but it's kind of interesting to see. So you see the diagram over there, a hot reservoir, 500K, we got a thousand kilojoules coming in from that one. Um, we've got 600 kilojoules being rejected to the cold reservoir and that, so those temperatures change for A, B, and C. And so the difference then is work that is produced by the cycle. So I guess a thousand minus 
600 is 400, right? So we got 400 hours of work going out, okay? So let's determine the nature of the cycle, compare actual cycle performance efficiency to maximum theoretical performance calculated by uh, equation, the equation for a power cycle. Okay, so now see here's an example where we didn't use, well, I mean, we could use temperatures or we can use um, the uh, heat flows. Well, I guess that, no, no, that's not quite right because the heat flows are saying this is what is happening in terms of the heat transfers. Then we can check the theoretical performance with the temperatures. So we say the actual efficiency that we're operating with is 40% by measured heat flows. Okay, so that's the real cycle. Maximum theoretical performance, so we'll calculate efficiency max. So there is our theoretical performance. So, so it says, okay, so I've got a power cycle that's operating at 40%. Given those two temperatures, a perfect ideal reversible cycle would have a 60% efficiency. So say that puts a cap on, you know, so if the boss comes and says, I want you to make this 65%, you might not want to laugh at his face, but when he goes out the door, you're going, that guy's an idiot. They don't know anything about thermodynamics. That's not possible. Here, it's a simple calculation. You know, so uh, now what you do to make him happy, I don't know, that's your problem. <laughs> Maybe you, somebody needs to subtly educate him. I don't know. Anyway, so you're at 40%. The theoretical max is 60%. So you're operating irreversibly, right? You just have dissipative effects in your process. So B, we plug in those temperatures and golly, it says you're operating at theoretical, which is 40%. You're operating 40%. Man, you're doing perfect, boss. Give me a raise, you know? Bingo. I, I, we're, we're doing this reversibly, which of course is not possible, but you know, but you can trump up these problems that way. And then the last one, we do it and we get 0.2. And they say, ah, something's wrong with something's wrong with your heat flow measurements, right? Because if you're operating between 400 and 500 K, the maximum efficiency you could get is 20%. You measure these heat flows and you say you're 40%. Now, the, the second law of thermo says you're full of horse feathers, <laughs> you know? So this is impossible. And so this is some of the stuff that we can do. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll finish this up next time and then work problems. Hope you guys have a great rest of the day.